So welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm excited about today's event and I know our viewers will be too. A quick introduction. I'm Brian Love, your co-moderator for today. And I'm also the head of banking and fintech at Trevilian, a boutique executive recruiting firm serving the financial services space since 1998. My division specifically covers financial institutions around the country, assisting with executive search, talent advisory, succession planning for boards, executives, and senior leadership teams. Please connect with us on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and visit www.trevilliangroup.com to sign up for our mailing list and learn about our bank practice and current search engagements. So the topic of today, we're facing unprecedented times in the banking industry. There's certainly no shortage of topics to talk about. And to do that, we're gonna to speak to one of the most respected individuals in the banking industry today, Johnny Allison, chairman and CEO of Home Bank Shares out of Arkansas's ticker symbol HOMB. The company was founded by an investor group led by Johnny in 1998, and they completed an IPO in 2006. Since then, Home Bank Shares has consistently ranked as one of the top performing and highest valued publicly traded banks in the US. I'd also like to introduce my co-moderator today, Joe Fennick. Joe, good to see you. Good to see you too, Brian. And with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? Hi everyone, I'm uh, Joe Fennick, Chief Investment Officer of GenOp Capital Management and also content contributor for Trevilian. I've uh, been following banks for a long time as an analyst and now as an investor for almost 24 years. And I've known Johnny Allison uh, for 16 years uh, when I first picked up research coverage of home following the company's IPO back in 2006. Um, I've talked to literally hundreds of community bank executives over the years. Um, and in my opinion, uh, Johnny Allison has the best gut feel for the business and economic cycle of anyone I've met. Um, not only that, but he's been able to translate that knowledge to results as one of the great value creators, I'll call it, in banking over the past three plus decades. In the late 80s, um, he was a buyer of failed banks in Texas as the largest shareholder of First Commercial Bank in Arkansas, which he sold to Regions Bank for four times book value in 1997, turned around the following year in 1998 and started Home Bank and was then the most prolific buyer of failed and distressed banks in Florida after the Great Recession in 2008, which is when I got to know him. And more recently, Johnny's returned to Texas with the acquisition of Happy State Bank. So Johnny, always good to talk to you. Thanks for thanks for being with us. Hi, Joe. Great, great to be with you again. Joe and I have been friends for many years and shared ideas and thoughts. And it's been, I think it's been a great relationship for both Joe and myself. Appreciate that. I uh, feel the same way. Um, so when we first talked to Johnny about doing this video, uh, we really wanted to talk just exclusively about M&A. And more specifically, you know, all the aspects of a successful M&A deal since Johnny's done so many of them in his career. So we're going to start there. But with things are changing by the day so much in the banking business and in the economy, there's a lot of other things I'd like to pick Johnny's brain about also. Um, but let's start with with M&A. You know, Johnny, all through last year, banks that were acquisitive were getting sent to what I'll call the penalty box after announcing their deals. The stocks were getting punished and it seemed to get worse as the year went on. Then you announced Holmes acquisition of Happy Bank and the deal was really well received by the market. It really stood out in terms of the market reaction relative to how we saw the market react to other deals. Um, what do you think, just stepping back for a second, is the differentiating factor just generally in the way that you at home approach M&A versus maybe how you think others take a look at it? Well, that's, that's, that's a pretty, I think there's a lot of difference, Joe. Number one, I'm the largest individual shareholder of home, so I'm not interested in dilution, and dilution doesn't do anything for me. So I don't want to dilute my shareholders. So what we're seeing happen in most of these trades today, they don't work. And the reason they don't work is because the buyer dilutes himself. It almost, I've seen deals where they dilute themselves into infinity. Well, maybe not infinity, but I asked my CFO, I said, when do they get return to tangible common equity? And he said, my computer doesn't have enough columns in it. So, I mean, why do you do that? So the real reason is they're tougher to do. Everybody wants to beat their chest and say, I got two times book. Well, if a buy, if a seller 
gets two times book and the buyers at 170 or 180 times book, it's diluted, 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 diluted to book, diluted to tangible book, and diluted to EPS. And who, the reason they go down is everybody sells the stock. Why do you want to sit around as, you're an investor, Joe, why do you want to sit around if it's a public company and, and, and wait till three and a half year earn back to tangible book or five year earn back to tangible book? So the sellers who think they're doing really good by getting two times tangible book are absolutely shooting themselves in the foot because they're taking the buyer down. They're hurting the buyer. And the smart sellers, I found a smart seller in a happy bank deal, a man who'd done several trades. And think about it, with the cost of doing the deal today with the double, double accounting from the Cecil acquisition, it just gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And you just almost are threading a needle to make to make a deal that, is, that makes sense for the seller and for the buyer. So as it gets tougher and tougher to do that, and I think we're educating more people in the world, home deal went up in the face of it. My quote to the world was, if this deal doesn't work, none of them work. Because I had visited with you on occasions about what you see that makes a deal work, we had our own ideas, we put all that together, and we made that trade. So you were instrumental in helping me make that trade. I appreciate that. I appreciate the support that you give me over the years because they are the work and they don't work, right? And if they're diluted, they don't work. And if they're public, if both sides of them are public, the funds are gone before the sun comes up in the morning. So you have no reason why. If I got a three and a half year earn back to tangible book, I say, Joe, stay with me for three and a half years. And you say, hell, Johnny, I got better things to do. So I'm going to go do something else. So I get it. That's, I think those are the big reasons. Oh, that's a great summary. I guess you, you touched on something with the relationship with Happy. It, it seemed to me on the conference call when you announced the deal that you really formed a, a good relationship with Pat Hickman, the chairman of that company. He really seemed to kind of buy into the the idea and, and 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 the combination. How important is that? I mean, have you ever done a deal where it's like you know, or maybe you found out after the fact, you know, maybe the the, the board of the target company really didn't kind of grasp what you're talking about? And how often is that sort of a deal killer for you when when the target is really not on board with the you know how you well, guys I'm, think about M and A? If the, I probably don't know that. I probably don't know the other side of that. I can feel it, though. I've, I've sold long enough in my life to feel. You have a feel about the deal. I mean, I met with Pat Hickman, and I, I sold as hard as I could sell based on Cecil and uh, Cecil double counting and dilution. And he said, well, you won't buy this bank at this price. And I stood up, and I, th I said, I want to, Pat, thank you for your time. I enjoyed the visit with you. Would y'all take me to the airport? And, the difference is I'm not bluffing. I mean, I mean it. I'm, I'm not going. I, I don't intend to dilute my shareholder. I ended up in this transaction, the happy deal, dilute my shareholder. The AOCI got me as of December 31st. They were up 27 million. Think about how quick this happened on a billion five book, up from up 27 to down 101 million at April 1st. And we had to market at that point in time. I apologize to my shareholders for that. And I got accolades from my shareholders for bringing it out, exposing it, talking about it. As you know, we've always been an open book. And I think that's important, the trust and confidence that Wall Street builds in you over the years. We don't lie. We tell it like, if you got good news, we'll brag about it. If you got bad news, we'll tell the street the same. I think, I think relationships going forward in the marketplace are extremely important. Johnny, Texas isn't a new market for you guys, for you personally. You had a lot of success there, as I said earlier, buying up failed banks after the bust in the 80s. But it is a new market relatively for home, for home bank shares. Do you do you approach M&A any differently when you're going into a new market for the company as opposed to when you're just looking to bolt on an existing market that you already have, like Florida? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't look. At, I didn't look at Texas as a new market. I mean, we we have about we had about eight hundred million dollars in the Texas market, as we when we bought Liberty out of Jonesboro, Arkansas. You remember that trade? Liberty had had about five hundred million or four hundred million in Texas. So we've continued that over a period of time. I mean, I've been in East Texas, and then we bought Liberty that was in North Texas and Dallas, and we still have those customers. And interestingly. Some of Happy's customers are the same. They have some of the same customers that we have. So it's just kind of going back in. We got to understand how they underwrite. We got to understand how they, how much leverage they put under it. That's that's really the the, the tough part is getting that. 
Texas is a great state. I read every classified asset that Happy had. I read every line of every classified asset. I want to see the down and dirty of the transaction. I want to see the worst case. And what you see, some of those loans they probably should not have made. But as you read these, they really do a great job of presentation of their of their classified loans. You read them to the point that I'm reading. I'm thinking. I'm thinking as I'm reading this 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 loan. I mean loan offer. Off ran loan document that they're going to they're going to blow up they're going to lose money on this deal at the end thank God for a great economy property sold paid in full so it, it just some of those loans in different markets might have had a loss in it that that they didn't have in Texas so I think they I think they got a little higher leverage you have to get accustomed to that you have to understand the rights however these guys. Their loan yield was better than my loan yield, and I run one of the best in the country. So I like that. Uh, they haven't had a lot of losses because of a great economy and good good customer base. So approaching it really, uh, it's the way I look at it is you got West Texas, and then you got Middle Texas with Dallas, Fort Worth, and Austin. That's kind of how I broke it up mentally in my mind. There's not as much. Not as much loan business in West Texas as there is. I mean, most of the loans Dallas Fort Worth were 60, 65 percent. All our loans are coming from. And Johnny, you said that you're pretty proud that you haven't lost one loan yet in that new transaction, correct? Yeah, that's right. We had a we had a guy that was in Lubbock that left us that ran that. Uh, he got it was a little divide there between Pat and and the new management that came in. Not us. Not us. They said Johnny and Tracy are great people. But I'm not going to work for the other guys. So anyway, so they leave, and which I think is rude. They just been in Arkansas eating my food and drinking my whiskey, and uh, tell me we're going to get on a white horse and ride off in the sunset together. But anyway, this guy left, so he took about 14 or 15 of his people with him, and he has uh, uh, he, 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 that made me a little angry, quite honestly. What he reason for that? And because uh, we hadn't done anything to anybody, we hadn't even we hadn't even been together, we hadn't even dated for 30 days yet, right? So anyway, yeah, we have not lost one loan yet, and uh, we may lose one or two over a period of time, but it'll be after the fact. Because one one thing about home bank shares is we have a fortress balance sheet, and we have we're sitting on four b four billion plus in liquidity. So I like our position really well, and we intend to keep our loans in Lubbock, Texas whatever it takes to get them done. We've already had two that they ran out on. We got both of those. So, so far, so good. Thumbs up. And it seems like to me, yeah, Johnny, Lubbock's just an interesting market. There's been so much dislocation in and around that market with mergers over the years. And and there's a lot of growth too, at the same time, right? It's a great market, um, you know, kind of in the broader scheme of things in Texas. But you, something you just said earlier, I wanted to ask you about, you know, you said a few years ago uh, to me, um, you said you think M&A deals work better when you're buying a private company versus buying a public company. You alluded to that in your comments earlier. I thought a lot about that over the years, and I think the mechanics of how that works probably has a lot to do with why the acquirer's stocks tend to get beaten up so bad post the deal announcement. But wanted to see if you could maybe flush that out a little bit more for us, what you meant by that. Well, you know, the the, the the one that got me was Stonegate, which is a really good bank we bought it in Florida. And, you know, and they took my stock down and then they put the ARBs on the, the ARBs got in there. They didn't care whether the stocks went up or down. They just wanted to make their spread in the deal. So I kind of lost control of my stock right at that point in time. In a, in a private transaction, there's not anybody to ARB on the other side, really. I guess they could short me if they wanted to. But they can't play. They, they can't play with the stocks. They can't sell them and or, excuse me, sell me short and buy them, or vice versa. So they can't do the transaction. I was actually on about a six billion dollar trade on a deal that felt that hits me pretty well on my footprint in uh, Florida. It was it expanded into some other states that I wasn't crazy about Mississippi, Louisiana. I wasn't too crazy about that. I was on that trade, and we were doing due diligence when the Happy deal came up. It was public, Happy's private, and I walk in on Monday morning. It was a weekend decision for me. I walk in on Monday morning. And I said, "We're off of the deal down south. We're working on the Texas deal. Let's get started on due diligence on that." So, because of it being private because of their margin being 
being good because of loan yield being better than mine. You don't find that very often. Those kind of combinations led me to move on that transaction. So I intend to go, there is real value to having a shareholder base. There is a strong value. And up until Stonegate, I managed my shareholder base, but I brought in a bunch of funds in the share in the deal with, with uh, Stonegate and that hurt my stock because they're selling, swapping, trading, arbing, all the different things that they do. So I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this private bank. So I did that, and I'm going out to 21st, 22nd, 23rd of this month and taking a team out, and we're going to try to visit. They're, all 1,300 individual shareholders are invited to hear the presentation that Tracy and I will make to, to them about values of banks and home bank shares and the future of home bank shares and we're getting good reception back from it so i'm really pleased with that because the the guy that left out of lubbock is poaching up trying to poach on our shareholders so anyway i just want to tell them at two and a half times book by the way trying to get trying to sell stock in an east texas bank that's about 500 million at two and a half times times book you may need to invest in that joe you make you can make a lot of book. <laughs> No, sounds like sounds like a need to make a bet on the other side of that trade. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I, anyway, that that I don't know. I think that's the reason that I switched to the private versus the public. Where do you think, Johnny? And I, you touched on this earlier, but I want to get your thoughts on a little more. Where do you think some of these uh, acquirers go wrong in the sense that well, what I see happening is like sometimes they get so far down the field in negotiating a deal, you maybe you get an influential investment banker in the mix. You got the target bank negotiating against you. The feeling that maybe you won't get shown another deal by the bankers if if you don't if you turn down this one, and it kind of snowballs on the acquire, and they get to the point where they feel like they can't walk away and say this is not the deal for me. I mean, you touched on it earlier, but is that basically what you do right up front, where you just say this is what I'm willing to do, and it's not really going to move all that much in either direction? Is that sort of the difference? Between I think it is, Joe. You know, we're extremely. We've been disciplined on loans. We're disciplined on deposit rates. We're disciplined on acquisitions. Sometimes it's difficult to be as disciplined as we are, but that's paid off for us over the years, and I think that'll continue to pay. I mean, there's just a maximum which you can go to, and if somebody wants more money than that out of a transaction or thinks they're worth more money than that, then good luck to them. You know, because obviously. I mean, on the happy deal, I was about 2.4 times tangible book. There were other bidders in there at 1.8, one 1.9 one times tangible book, bidding real close to me. So it would have been diluted to them. And then you got the investment banker out there and said, well, the market will accept. They'll accept two and a two and a half year earn back. They'll accept four year earn back. The market will accept that. That's a little little stretch of it, but the mark we'll sell this, we'll sell that. And they sell all the window dressings around it. They say, well, it's a great market and the population's growing and, and, and the average income in this area, that's all window dressing. Number one, what does the deal look like? What does it do to you? What do you look like after you put the numbers together to two banks? Is it accretive, accretive, accretive? So home has, has been blessed, excuse me, knock on wood, we've been blessed to do uh, an accretive, accretive, accretive deal. We model everything at 33% cost savings. We, we may get better than that, but we model everything at 33% cost savings so I can compare deal 14 to deal 22 to deal seven, and how are we doing here? Are we losing our, are we moving in a different direction? And I think that's positive. We're on a deal now that is, we're modeling at 33, I think there's 66% cost savings in the deal. So, you know, will we play? I don't know, it's not something I started out to do, it's just something I got to thinking about it fits me in some areas and may make a lot of sense from a, a from from a, from an acquisition. You know, you got to build, right? You get where's the two best states in the nation? You got Florida and Texas, and that it. That's where the people are moving. And Georgia's not too bad, by the way. But you got Florida and Texas, but that's the two states. And I think I build long-term value by continuing to acquire those markets. That's interesting that you say uh, the 33. I've heard you say that before. The 33% cost saves. But now that I'm thinking about it, that makes it, it lets you compare apples to apples rather than maybe diluting yourself and saying maybe you stretch the cost saves and it makes the numbers look a little better it's like no we're going to use this same number on every deal so we can compare deal one to deal two to deal three yeah my, my people might come in and put 40 percent or 50 percent i said give me one at 33 
so I can compare the deals to make sure they're straight. So we may expect to get more cost saves than that, but it sure gives us a barometer of what, what, to, what to commit to the company to. I wanted to ask Johnny a big picture question before the next M&A one. You know, there's obviously a lot going on in the world right now. We're in, we're in crazy times, right, in terms of the economic and the market outlook. Relative to other points in your career, you know, you've been through a lot of different um, periods, like I'm sure like this. Is this a time to seize opportunity or is it a time to hunker down and be cautious? In other words, are you, are you excited right now or are you worried? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, Joe, that's, I'm, I'm both. The, the, the bad news is I'm old enough to have been around and seen March of 80 and 82. The good news is I was able to see that crisis. I was able to see under the Carter administration rates at 21%. I, was, I, I watched that. I know that February 5th, 1982, the U.S. issued a 14.87% 30 year U.S. government bond. I'm, taking, I'm sitting on $4 billion because I call this inflation. I've been calling it for a year and a half. I said it's coming. The Fed's just whistling down through the park, holding hands with each other and doing nothing. I mean, somebody's got to step up and stop this. You got inflation running. I think it's running closer to 20%, but based on their numbers, I think it's eight or nine. Yeah, I do. Eight or nine percent inflation. But you got to get at some point in time. You got to get rates up close to the rate of inflation. You got to neutralize those two, and nothing's going on. So, and, and bankers really, quite honestly, we had a 25 basis point increase and they just were walking in the park with the Fed whistling and they paid no attention. Now 50, now we're looking down the barrel of probably three or four fifties, I think. I said at the on the conference call, conceivably, you can see a 7% Fed fund rate. I said, that's conceivable, you could see that. Well, I saw a 21% Fed fund rate. We need a Volcker type reaction. Bullard out of St. Louis Fed is beating the table for it. I think from that point, I have I've deployed 250 million of the four billion excess cash I have. Security rates are beginning to look like loan rates. So when you're getting a 470 or a 510 on a security rate with little risk versus 510 or 530 on a loan rate with risk, that gets that gets interesting. Where do you put the money? Where do you, we're in the loan business and we're going to loan. We're going we're going to loan money. But I'm sitting on four billion. I put 25% of that in loaning, 75% in in securities at four, five, six, and seven. Are we going to say an eight or nine on the security side? I'm sitting on that cash, and I'm sit I sit on it at 15 basis points at the Fed. So I just I haven't spent any of it. I've just sat on it. I'm going to wait till the next kick, the next 50 basis points, and at that point in time, I'm going to move. So am I excited? For one aspect, for my balance sheet, what I'm going to be able to deploy and the, the excess capital I have, I'm really excited about that. I mean, you take four billion times six. If it was a six percent handle, that's 240 million dollars. I can figure that out. Even coming from Jonesboro, Arkansas, my Jonesboro math, that's 240 million dollars pre-tax. That's a buck a share. I get it. I get where I'm headed, and I think you can see where I think I'm headed with this deal. I think it makes lots of sense. And then you turn around and look at these other people in the marketplace today, and they're 96% loan to deposit. Well, what's their shot? You know, they can't do securities. The AOC is upside down. So it really is, it's an interesting time in the marketplace. It really is interesting. But we decided to build a fortress balance sheet at home, and that's what we've done. We, we paid off our 5.62% uh, sub-debt and reissued prior to that. 60 days prior to that, we did a three and eight sub debt. We've got four or $500 million sitting at the holding company. The only debt we'll have, period, will be the $300 million and then happy sub debt. We couldn't pay it off because it's not called for three more years. But the company's in great financial condition. Asset quality is superb. Maintain two and a half percent reserves. You know that. I'm a big reserve guy. I layer with too much capital. I layer with too much reserve. At the end of the day, this is my baby and I built it with my great team and it's my largest asset and I intend to protect it and still remain one of the most profitable banks in America. We were, as you know, Forbes ranked us 
number one again this year. That's three out of five years that home has been ranked the number one bank with Forbes, and that's quite an honor. We appreciate it. So while doing while doing all this, the first quarter and the fourth quarter last year, I'm sitting on three and a half, four billion dollars that I didn't deploy. I think I'm in a great position to deploy that money. Well, yeah. So, so Johnny, here's a question. Obviously, these economic times are, are you know, pretty incredible. But I can't remember a time when banking itself was changing as fast as it has been, you know, today and over the last decade or so. You've got the threat from fintech and other disruptions with technology. Customer delivery channels are changing. Um, seemingly, branches are dying, you know, a little bit. Um, you're in incredibly hot markets where where the bank is that are growing and competitive. There's an influx of population. Does home take the same approach it always has in terms of executing on the basic blocking and tackling of banking? Or have there been changes that you've had to make to keep the company performing at the level that it does? No, we're still blocking and tackling just like we were. We, we don't, we're a very disciplined company. We don't, we don't have anything exotic here. We block and tackle, but we block and tap, tackle with a sub 40 efficiency ratio. So, you know, that you can't beat that. You know, you, you, you can stack up. Donna Townsend took our company from 62%. She'd been in banking six months, by the way. She took, took it from 62% to sub 40 and made herself a superstar. So my job is picking out the superstars. So I remember when the ATM came in in Arkansas, and one guy had the entire lock on ATMs in Arkansas, and that was exciting. And that, it, it, nobody else thought he's going to control the world. Well, he didn't. Greed sets in, and they, well, he leases some, he sells some, and here we go. We all get ATMs now. So, you know, I'm not worried about the fintech side of it at all because somebody's going to sell me a piece of something. We're invested. I don't know. We got how much, Don? $10, $12 million invested. Am I worried about it? I'm really not worried about it. I mean, I just saw one of them recently that lowered their credit score to 300 on the fintech side. I mean, can you imagine 300? I've never seen a 300 credit store score. You have to work to deliberately pay nobody in the world and be a total deadbeat to win the 300 deal. So, and by the way, they blew up. So these banks have been funding, funding these fintech deals better take a strong look at them because I think their, their funds could dry up. So are we invested? We are. And if somebody builds a better mousetrap, we may have to pay double for it or triple for it, but that's that's my attitude. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay doing what we do, what brought us here, what made us, but I'm gonna keep, I don't want to wake up with a manual typewriter either. So I'm not interested in that. So I have Donna who stays involved in that and my Kevin Bartholomew, who runs our data operation, stays involved in that. So, and I, I've been to a couple of those deals. I'm listening and looking myself. I'm a business, look, I'm a businessman first. I, I, became, I was a businessman before I was a banker. I think that gave me a great edge. I've been in the foxhole. I've worried about Friday's payroll. I've worried about whether these people come to work or not. And it gave me amazing, when I was 28, I was running three mobile home plants that I owned and hired the people and put it together and was became a little public company at one point in time so i had that experience so all of that combined just i think gives me an edge because most bankers will tell you how to run your business but they've never run one they've never faced friday's payroll they've never they've never faked they've never done a workman's comp what are you doing on group insurance they've never dealt with that because most bankers that's done at the corporate level and they're just they're branch managers that, that run these different no disrespect to bankers they'll tell you how to run it but they've never been there so i think that gives me i look for foxhole people people that can get in the foxhole for in a battle yeah i had a oh, go ahead just go ahead, a quick follow-up question yeah. to that the efficiency ratio is amazing before i was a recruiter i worked at a bank that was sub 50 sub 40 percent efficiency ratio and it was a little bit of a taxing place to work i loved working there but I wonder culturally, and I can tell that you are the figurehead where the culture comes out of at home, but how do you preserve that culture in the entire organization, especially as it grows to new geographies and absorbs teams? It, it, has, it has become a way of life. Our company operates, the, when I report to the public, I report ROAs and ROAs and efficiency ratios. 
have 13 divisions that report, report upstream to Tracy, French, and myself. And when they report to us, they report ROAs, ROEs, efficiency ratio. We're training those guys in the marketplace to be Wall Street guys. We're training to them to think how we think. And if one of our branch managers can figure out a way, and we have now had 206, 220 branches, they can figure out a way to save $100 in that branch. They bring it upstream to the corporate office. And we institute that if we like it in all branches. So the, it became a way of life and a culture in this company as a result of a lady who had been with us six months who took this. I asked my chief operating officer, well, you're giving that to Donna? Yeah, I said, you don't like Donna Townsend? He said, I like her a lot. I said, well, she's going to fall down. He said, she's only been in the bank in six months. And he said, she falls, I'll pick her up. And amazingly, the process with Metabonte, they, we hired this Metabonte team. They came in and helped us. And Donna led 74 of our own people and took, but she had 100% backing from me and the executive manager of this company. That's the difference. The Liberty Bank deal in Jonesboro, Arkansas, we, they went through the same study, copied what we did. And when it was over, they said it won't work. Well, two years later, we buy Liberty, and it, we take it from 20 million to 40 million in profits in 18 months. So there, I mean, bam, there you go. It's it it is it is the single biggest move in the corporate history of home bank shares that changes the numbers. And don't tell me it won't work. Now we are thin in some places. There's only one Johnny. There's only one Donna. There's only one Tracy. You know, we are thin, and Kevin Hester carries a load. We all carry a load. We all carry a load, but they're all vested in the stock, and all of them are multimillionaires, and I'm thrilled for them. I'm thrilled for them. I think it's wonderful. They've made it happen, and they've been rewarded. I was going to say, Johnny, I remember the plan a few years ago where if you kind of look at the stock holdings of some of your mid- and senior-level executives, you're right. I mean, they're, you know, multi-millionaires, right, from the stock ownership, and I, I'm Correct. sure... Correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that probably had to open some eyes all around the company, just seeing how those people performed and how they were rewarded for it, right? I, I, there's not any doubt about it. They list, Arkansas Business lists the top 100 shareholders, top stock holdings, the top 100 stock holdings of individuals in Arkansas. And there's more home bank share people on that list than there are Tyson, Walmart, or J.B. Hunt people. So my point is, we share with our people, they make it happen. There's no, I mean, they're, they're just local people. I mean, there's they, they, my entire executive team is just local people from Cabot, Conway, and this area, you know them all. And it, it's, it's really rewarding to see that, that happen. Plus the fact that people believed in home bank shares when we started, and we probably created more millionaires in Arkansas than anybody's ever created in Arkansas. I don't know that for sure, but I guarantee you it's probably true. So that's, I mean, how many steaks can you eat and how many jets can you fly? I got all the toys. It's their turn. It's a, it's my people's turn to really enjoy their life. And more and more of them. And when, every time I find a superstar, I promote them, move them up, put them in a stock program, and say, here's, here's the ball. Run with it. Johnny, heading into this year, I thought we could maybe see one of the busiest M&A years we've seen in a long time. It seemed like all the stars were coming together. And now it could wind up being one of the slowest years on record. Would you be comfortable? I know what you said earlier, explain kind of how you're thinking about the liquidity deployment. But would you be comfortable doing an M&A trade in this environment? Or are there just too many wild cards out there to think about doing something that even might look really good on paper? Well, Joe, where there's something bad, there's something good. So you got to find that opportunity out there. And being a businessman has, in the past, we've made great calls. God bless us. We've made great calls. We've done 25 trades here. They've all been accretive, accretive, accretive. There you go, Joe. You got your phone ring. <coughs> They've all been accretive, accretive, accretive. So anyway, I think uh, I'm not afraid of the deal. The world's not going to come to end. If it does, then we got bigger problems. We got far bigger problems than that. If there's something that's sitting on top of me that I can do and I can get all the savings out of it and, and just really have the loan team left in place, I think, I think that makes some sense for me to do that. Now, risk-wise, I may take $2 billion of that and put it in, in, in securities and $2 billion in loans. I may do that. Depends on the right. Someone said, what's the number that moves you? And I said, I don't know, but 
but but I'll, I'll know it when I see it. So we just deployed about, gave our security group the authority to deploy 250 million. They deployed 50 million in the four and a half and five percent range. I'll take that. Low risk securities, I'll take that. I, I mean, I like that. So I think there's really good, I don't think the world's going to crash. I think there's good opportunities. I have not been buying my stock lately, and I told them, I said, just let it, let them keep taking it down. That's fine. Just let them keep taking all the bank stocks down. When we decide to buy, we'll go in there and buy a million or two million shares of home. So we got the cash to do that. That's not that's not bragging. We just got the money. We we, we have built this fortress balance sheet. I mean, we don't we have one of the best capitalized banks in America, and certainly one of the best reserve banks in America, with one of the best asset quality, asset quality banks. So I think overall we built this fortress company to go to take advantage of opportunities. Uh, on the asset quality front, you know, it's really confusing time in my, in my opinion. On the one hand, there's some things out there that make me really nervous. And we talked about this, you know, these FinTech lenders, you talked about it earlier too. Right. They use computers and algorithms to lend money all around the country. They don't have a core deposit funding base on the other side of the balance sheet. That sort of stuff scares the heck out of me. All they seem to want to talk about is lowering the cost to get a customer, but we never hear them talk about their plans for making sure the customer pays them back. Right? <laughs> On the other hand, you know, banks like yours, real conservative companies are basically saying credit's as good as it's ever been. What do you think happens from here on out, not just for home, but for the industry and just the economy in general? Is credit, is credit fears, or are credit fears overblown here or are we kind of at the tip of the iceberg in your opinion? Well, we've stressed, you know, we've stressed all of these loans when we book them. We stress them 200 basis points to see what happened to them, and they all work at 200 basis points. We think we think we're great. I don't think they work at four or five hundred basis points. That's where the trouble could be. That's where the trouble could be. And banks are going to have to kind of pick their partners at that point in time. I believe. I mean, they can't. I was one of my big credits was in the other day, and I said, well. He said, he owes me, I don't know, $200 million right now. He'd been with me since day one. And he said, Johnny, I'm going to need another $130 million. And I said, well, tell me why and for what. And he goes through this progress, and it's it, the federal government funds a lot of the stuff that they get. So they're getting a big increase in, in daily rates or monthly rates, whatever it is. They're getting a big increase, which is going to create more revenue for them, which is going to make more money. But as a result of that, they need to go into the, some of these facilities that were two beds in a room and convert them to one bed. They're all going in redoing the air conditioning systems. You know, the, the, it's a nursing home operation. So the COVID, the COVID deal hurt them. So they're cleaning up, the government's coming in to help them. You won't have double rooms in the future. You'll have single rooms and all this air, new air conditioning system being put in these places. He said, I'm gonna need that money to revamp these deals. But you know, I'm probably going to loan him the money. I like his field. I like what he's doing. Now, during the during the pandemic, a lot of a lot of families went and got their loved ones in these nursing homes and brought them home. And they had, but they got through that and they made had a great year last year. So, overall, I, I think I see some cracks in credit out there. I really don't see it on. Uh, Maybe office. If I see anything out there, maybe office. I mean, hotels have pretty well healed up somewhat. I mean, the, the worst hotels were the airport hotels because they nobody was going flying right now that people are back flying. Airport hotels are back up. Highway hotels are back up. And if you had a hotel that you could see the water from, they never slowed down. They made more money than they've ever made. So, you know, what what else can go wrong, right? What else could possibly go wrong? Everything, but I, you know, I'm not too worried about asset quality at this point. The asset prices are going up. They're going to go up. Here's the danger. Here's the danger. At two hotels in Texas, the Mez money in both of them were eight or nine million dollars. The Mez had been in for five years and they're leaving. Well, they really hadn't had any principal pay down on this hotel because we deferred the hotels we deferred during it it's had very little principal pay down so the 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 sponsors come to us won't let's take the mass out well, why would i take the mass out i'm not going to take the mass out there's the danger 
There's, it's not the first loan because you do it right. It's the second loan that comes back. Well, the appraisal's here. Well, I don't care what the appraisal says. You know, if I should have been the mass money drawing 14% in the hotel originally if I'm going to, if I'm going to take it at, at the end of five years. So those kind of risks are, are out there. I let them go. I let, I let the loans go. Some banks did it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to lay my head on my pillow tonight, and I'm going to know that I didn't put another $8 million in those hotels. I'm still senior in the deal today, and if if I get paid off, which I'm getting paid off on one, probably getting paid off on the other, so be it. I'll lay my head on the pillow. There's the danger. Those are the ones that are going to get in trouble. Not the first one. It's the second one. Johnny, if you had to list them out, just big picture, what would you say are the two or three or four things you need to see happen you said before you were excited and worried. What, what are the two to three to four things that if they happen, take away your all your worries and make you just super excited the way you were maybe in 08, 9, 10 down in Florida or wherever else? Is it just asset valuations or there other, is it stuff you just need to see happen from here? I actually want rates to go up. I actually want rates to go up. I think because I'll deploy my funds as rates go up and I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss the, the 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 rates going up. Now that's good on one side of the sheet, sheet and that may be bad on the other side. But my loans overall are 57 percent loan to deposit, and these guys will not let that go. They're not going to let the milk cow go as we did in 08, 09, Joe, when nobody had any money in the deal, right? They just threw the keys to you. It's a different world today. So I I think I think that that the asset prices going up are not all bad. I think the fact that we get it, what would make me super, that may create some opportunity. But if rates go up, I think that's going to be good for me, and I'm going to be able to deploy my $4 billion into four, five, six, seven, eight percent yields back for me. So it's going to give me, and if they go too high, I'll lock into some governments, long term governments. It's not going to stay there forever, it's going to come back. But it could be, we could be in a three or four year run here. So, some banks are going to get in trouble. I've got a war chest of capital sitting here today. I can move. If failed banks start again, I can move. You know, we made a lot of money during the failed bank time. You remember that's where we got our New York office from that's made 75 to $100 million a year pre-tax for us for the last seven years, and they've never had a pass due that I know of. So, uh, it, it, that was an opportunity, but that was a businessman that recognized that opportunity. Most bankers just say, well, what happened? What happened? Why did Johnny do that? Why did, what's Johnny doing in New York City? What's he doing up there? What's, what's he doing? Well, the whole world said that, and now they found out over the last seven years. Our little Marine book, I'm at my house in Florida. People, The pandemic's hitting. They said, what, what can people do? And I look at the marina, and here they're lined up to get into their boats where they can social distance and they can take their family out and they can throw their anchor out and have a picnic on the sandbar. But I said, that's it. It's Marine. It, Marine's going to be huge. And it has been huge. So I don't know. Just being able, the Lord has given me the ability to, to recognize those opportunities over a period of time. And I think I'll see them again this time. But it's the business background, Joe, that got me there. Bonnie, real quick, in Texas and Florida in your career, right? You went into Texas in the 80s after a big bust. You went into Florida uh, after a big bust in a big way. Now you're building in Texas and you did a, a real nice trade, I think, with Happy. Um, but you're, you're, you're in Texas where, you know, the, the, the door bust and uh, off the seams, right? the economy is so strong down there. Well, where do you go from here in Texas in a market that's already really strong like how, take us through what what your big picture plans are for texas if you wouldn't mind well i i pretty much take what they give us i'm not uh i think it's i think it's it's kind of a convoluted statement of different banks everywhere i think there's an opportunity to consolidate a group of that am i going to push that to do that i'm not going to do that i'm not going to push the envelope just like loans you push on a deal and you pay too much Believe me, before we did the happy deal, there were at least three groups from Texas that had been in my office in Arkansas wanting to do a trade with us. But it was two times booked, two times booked, two times booked. 
And I said, I'm not going to pay that. I just can't pay that. I, 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 I can't do that. And they're beginning to get it. One of the guys that one of the guys that was here before has called Tracy back and said, I get what Johnny's saying. I understand. I, I understand now. I didn't understand then. I just I wanted to be able to go to the country club and say, I got two times tangible book for my company and I have a drink and brag about it when in fact it wasn't a great trade. So my attitude is we'll just take what they give us from here. If they give us a good opportunity, someone shows us a good opportunity then we'll grow. But the main thing is execute, execute on happy. That's the main thing. From your perspective as an investor looking at Johnny's group here, can home execute? You know we can because you've seen us do it over and over and over again. But the key is, will we be able to execute the way we need to do it? Happy has a 64% efficiency ratio. It's heavy. It's fat. We need to get that pull that down over a period of time. The people don't work. I mean, they have too many employees. Some of these people in Lubbock may have done us a favor, right? So they have, as Donna said, Donna said they helped us cut efficiency ratio pretty quick. So anyway, we're pretty, we're not disappointed with that. But I think we take what they give us. For me to say that I have a real plan, the plan will develop. You know, we do all these strategic plans, and then tomorrow, quick story, Joe. Donna and I had a bank conference recently. We're going to the room to freshen up, go, go to the bar and have a drink and go to dinner. Well, we're walking and one of the investors said, Johnny, go have a drink with me. I said, okay. So we sat down to have a drink. Five minutes later, a CEO of that I respect walks in that I hadn't seen in years, sits down to say hi. We start talking. We spend about 30 minutes talking and he looks at me and said, Johnny, we ought to put these companies together. And I said, you know what? I'd do that with you. There's not many I'd do that with, but I'd do that with you. So we walk off and Donna said, what just happened? And I said, a conversation started. You know, that's all, just a conversation. But my point is, you spend all your time doing strategic plans and suddenly the world changes on you in a matter of five minutes because you went to the bar and had a drink. So my point is that, that I'll take what they give us We'll continue to do the right thing for our shareholders from now on until we at some point in time find a partner like this particular person to be a partner with. So that's how quick it changes, Joe. Donna said, did you sell me? I said, no, not yet. But anyway, that's how quick it happened. Well, Johnny, we're getting towards the end of our time here. Um, I had one question for you. It's a little off script here. You know, you you obviously are, you know, have built an incredible franchise a couple times over now. But who do you look to in the industry? What bank or banker, you know, is the one that you kind of listen to or emulate or had the most impact on you as a banker? Well, I, I, I pay attention to Jamie Dimon. I pay attention to him. I, I have tremendous respect for First Financial out of Texas, Pinnacle out of Tennessee. Those are great companies, well-run companies. Uh, we run in that league with those guys, and, and you end up developing common respect among each other as great operators and, and, and running great companies. But I guess the guy I listen to uh, more than anyone else, probably because Jamie, Jamie has an audience and he has a platform, and when he decides to speak, people listen to him. And, and I, I end up agreeing with him on 95% of the issues, so when he says he thinks inflation is, is going to be going to be around longer and longer and rates are, could be five or six or seven percent, I listen to that. So uh, I think he's a great leader. I, I, I think he's a great leader. Outside of that, uh, my peers are my friends at, at, at Pinnacle, uh, Prosperity, uh, David Zalman, great job over the years. Uh, First Financial, that's just a group. Of, there, there's five or six or seven of us that run in this this top status. Glacier, that's another great bank out of out that we talked about them a while ago. They just do some of these banks just really do a great job. And when you get an opportunity to visit with those CEOs, you want to visit with them. Yeah, certainly. Well, as we as we finish up here, the one thing that you mentioned to me, you basically you're an entrepreneur, true and th through and through, and you've got that stranded throughout your whole business from top to bottom and you have your people thinking like entrepreneurs um that's pretty inspiring stuff and uh you know 
with that, I, you know, we, I guess we're out of time. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add there. I just wanted to say that when I'm in college, Kimmons Wilson came to Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. Kimmons Wilson was the founder of Holiday Inn. Kimmons drove in. He'd just taken the Holiday Inn public. A limo pulled him in. The driver got out and opened the door, and I was one of those redneck college students standing there, and I was in awe. And he came, he motivated me. He lit me up. And I, I listen to him, and I still follow him today, and I still quote him today. There is no substitute for experience. He's exactly right. And I called him about 15 years later after I was in business, and he finally called back three weeks later and said, Kevin Wilson, John Allison, what do, you, what do you want? I said, I want to say thank you, Mr. Wilson. He said, for what? And anyway, great story. His whole demeanor changed. He said, come see me. I hate that I never saw him before he died, but I mean, he's a great leader and a great entrepreneur. As a result of that, I speak to college students when I can, just to touch, see if I can touch somebody that, that and, and repay Kimmons Wilson for what he did for me. Well, I might hand you my resume after this call. You're an inspiring guy. Uh, <laughs> But I just wanted to thank you sincerely. I speak for Joe and I. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to answer our questions. Um, congratulations on what you've achieved. Also, congrats on your health. Um, I know you went through something and you're doing well. Yep. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. I think our listeners are going to love listening to this. Very informative. And so just again, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, and I read your newsletter. You're doing it. You're, you're you're doing really great work for the banking space. Congratulations. Thank you, Johnny.